What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. I'm Bob Wankel. Anthony Sanfilippo is here. And the Philadelphia Phillies, Anthony, are ever so close. So close to clinching a wild card spot and wrapping up the four seed, which would allow them to host a first round playoff series starting on October 3rd. Good series against the Braves. A nice start against the Mets here this weekend. I'll bring you in. I feel... I feel it. I can feel it in the air. I, I feel like it's coming, man. I feel like we're going to get this red October going here uh, um, about two weeks from now. Yeah, I mean, so the magic number is down to four to get into the playoffs, and I think it's still technically six for six. the for the actual home field. Um, but that's a good thing. I mean, like th- those are those are numbers that are now, Bob, completely within the Phillies' control. So, like, you don't even have to worry – about anybody else you have nine games nine games left is that three six nine games left yep. uh if you win six of those nine against the Mets and the Pirates you are in you are home field throughout you don't have to worry about another team losing or what anybody else is doing you go six and three in your last nine games you're hosting the wild card um obviously if you only win five then you need somebody to lose a game but you know but that's that's the level of where it's at right now I mean you would almost have to have these other teams be perfect the rest of the way to catch you. So like the Phillies are in a really, really good spot. The the important thing I think here over the nine last nine games, and I started writing this uh, today. Um, I haven't sent it over to Kevin yet just because I need to put a picture in. I haven't done the pic. The only thing I didn't do was the, the photo uh, credit for it, but um, so we're going to get into the last night and Alvarado, I think is kind of like the, the main story, but this is now a few players who you're starting to see kind of start to get themselves going in the right direction again. And it's the right time to get going in the right direction again. So if you have those guys where you need them to be, or at least pointed in that direction combined with the players who've been carrying you, then they're a dangerous team. Yeah, I think uh, we we have to start with Nick Castellanos. He's been the story both in the final game against the Braves and then last night. You know, Alvarado was what I wrote about in the newsletter today. It sounds like that's the the approach you're going to take on crossing broad. We both wrote about Castellanos yesterday. Yeah. Um, and I think we said a lot of the, the same things. We did not consult one another when we, no, we took no, this first part. You did the long form thing and I squeezed it together in a newsletter. So. Right. Um, I, I want to start with him. And, and, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about him throughout the season. You go back to March and we said, like, can he rebound? It's so important for him to get off to a good start. It, so much of what happened last year, it felt like things snowballed against him. And certainly he got off to a great start the season. He makes an all-star team. And then things go totally sideways on him during the month of July. August was a little up and down. You know, he was feeling his way through it. He bounced back. But then he hit some turbulence again, a little bit of a shaky stretch. But what he has done here over the last handful of games, I think is like an exclamation point on his his rebound season. We're talking about a guy here that is now well over 100 runs batted in. He's probably going to finish with 30-plus home runs. There's an outside chance that he finishes with 70 extra base hits. The OPS is creeping up towards 800. Like, The numbers were kind of like, eh, when we got to the end of August, the beginning of September. But the way that he's finishing here, a heck of a season. And more importantly, you just hope, because we've seen him do this, where he's been able to kind of carry these stretches. You hope that it just carries in to that first week of October. Like, don't run out of gas just quite yet, Nick. I'll tell you, Bob, it's all about, it's not even about the running out of gas. With him, it's so weird. It's about, it's all about focus with him. Is He's got to remain focused on himself and, and the way he's supposed to be at the plate. Because when Nick Cassiano starts chasing pitches, which we've seen a lot last year, almost the entire year, this year when he's not going well, he chases. And he gets jumpy, like loves to, Loves to swing it, you know, and I called for this actually at one point a few weeks back, and then he did it too much. It is that he was just jumping at the first pitch all the time. And, and it, look, I don't mind you swing at the first pitch. A lot of times the first pitch is the best pitch you're going to get in at bat. But if you have, you know, 
a situation where you got runners in scoring position or whatever, and a pitcher's been, you know, you're working, your team's been working the pitcher for the inning. The last thing you want to do is just go up there hacking and, and just hit a weak ground ball to third or lazy pop up to right. Like those are the last things you want to do on the first pitch. So it's being more selective in when you decide to be aggressive in that at bat. So I, I think when, when you see him at his, when you see him at his best, it's when he is that way, when he's being selective and waiting for pitches that he feels that he can hit and drive and having good plate appearances. It's when he gets very, you know, open to chasing any slot. He loves a slider. Anytime he sees one, he's going after it. But if it's out of the zone and he's chasing, then he's in trouble because then he starts dipping that shoulder a bit and he starts lunging at pitches and he misses them. Or if he makes contact, it's weak contact. That's what, that's when Nick Cassianos is going wrong. So, you hope, like you said, what you're seeing right now, can he maintain it into October? We'll see. But, I mean, he when he does this, he usually does do it for an extended period of time. He does. And I think, you know, in addition to the, the offensive numbers and the performance that we're seeing at the plate right now, just a, a really remarkable season in a lot of ways. When you think about what he was a year ago, where he was at a year ago, he talked about, not fitting in or, or trying to kind of find his fit here. He was a little bit uncomfortable. There were things, you know, with the family missing his children, just kind of going through a little bit of a transition period. And so much of it was about finding that fit and finding that comfort level. And he's achieved that this season. And we've seen the stuff with his son uh, at different points throughout the season. We've obviously seen him uh, be somewhat of a philosopher at different times. He's, he's kind of, stood up for Trey Turner when he was going through his struggles. He's taking Johan Rojas under his wing. And I think that's one of the more, I don't want to say remarkable things about his season, but I've, I found it fascinating to watch his growth year over year as he sort of morphed into this clubhouse leader, which not that he was a bad clubhouse guy a year ago. I don't, I don't think that at all, but he certainly did not have this type of presence and this type of energy around him. I mean, what we've seen here over the last week, the, the story about Johan Rojas and the buttons on the jersey, and I know that that's, that's gone back to the, the, you know, the spring. You, you had actually I wrote a story about that months ago yeah. um, about him being somewhat of a mentor there. But it's like it, it's getting fun now with Nick Castellanos. You have his wife tweeting like, hey, ladies, no more buttons. <laughs> you know, you got Kyle <laughs> Peggett at Crossing Broad talking about him turning the rest of the team into dirty little sluts. Like, there's a lot of fun stuff going on with Nick Castellanos along with the production. And it's just like one more story about this Phillies team. And I'll go back to something you said a few weeks ago. Like, if they can win the World Series, you know, do they go down as one of the most loved teams all time in the history of the city? And this is just like another storyline that you can kind of throw into that that makes you say like, yeah, probably. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, I didn't know exactly where where you were going. Yeah, I mean, like, that. It's, but, it's I mean, just, you're right. It's amazing. Like, it's just amazing how much like like comedy and like just the laughs and the I, I you know I don't want to use the word vibes, but I use the vibes. Like, there's a lot of really good vibes and cool vibes around Nick Castellanos right now. You know, there is. And and it's funny because he's such a when you I love the fact that you called him a philosopher, right? Because there are times when you get him in the clubhouse and he's and he's great and he gives you those long, thought out, well, well, you know, constructed answers, and you're like, Oh wow, how about that? that guy's really, you know, on the ball with this, especially like the Trey Turner one was one of my one of the best ones of the year. I mean, when he's sitting there saying, just think about this, he's still gonna be playing for the Phillies. I'm gonna be sitting in a bar with my son having a drink, right? I mean, like that kind of stuff is you puts it in perspective. And then there's nights where he doesn't want to give you anything, like the like when after he throws the guy out in Atlanta, and it's funny because like sheepishly he knows. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have caught that ball, and, and I probably shouldn't have, you know, put the put us put it on the onus of me making a guy throwing a guy out of the plate uh, to to win a game. But at the same time, I did it, <laughs> and it, and it worked. So like he gives you the voices in his head, and then he just kind of lets it go. And I swear to God, I thought last night for a second and just a second because then he he smiled after he he answered it, but. I thought he was going to kill Tim Kelly from Philly's nation. <laughs> Bob, Tim <laughs> Kelly goes, were the voices in your head talking to you? Tonight? <laughs> and the look on his face when Tim asked the question in that first instant was like, what the hell kind of 
clown question was that? And then he gave him an answer, and it was and he was smiling, and he answered. As I was like, "Phew, that was one we got away with." Like, yeah, he, he, like that could have gotten he held the breath. Like, where is where is this going to go? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean I, that that play in Atlanta uh, is is so perfectly Nick Castellanos. It, it was like a in a lot of ways, I think it was symbolic of his entire season where you're like, what the hell are you doing? And, and then in the next breath, you're like, wow, <laughs> great job. Yeah. Um, you know, and watching that in real time, I mean, it's such an important play. If they lose that game, is it devastating in terms of their ability to reach the playoffs or host the playoff game? Probably, probably not, but it, it does make things a little bit more dicey. And you want to win that series down in Atlanta. Like you want to go to Truist park and show the Braves that we can beat you in a series. And he said, after the fact, like we're all worried about October. Like, do we really want to put that much stock in this series? No. And he's right. And I, we talked about that earlier this week. I said, the Phillies, I don't really think can, can gain a whole lot here in terms of making a statement by beating this Braves team this week. But when you have the four, nothing lead and you get a decent start out of Aaron Nola and you feel like they're going to win this series, and then for them to almost lose it, it would it would have stung. Like that would have left a bad taste in your mouth for sure. So for Castellanos to come up in that spot and make that play, that type of throw in the moment, and then deliver an all time quote twenty minutes later, uh, it just it's just one of these things. And I feel like that this is what happens with good teams. You get these these stories and it's just another personality. It's another anecdote. It's another thing to kind of just throw into it that when you watch this team play next month, you're going to want them to win just a little bit more. You, you have just a little bit more of a connection forged between you and the team. Like it creates just a little bit more energy and enthusiasm. And I, I, that's one of the things I've really felt like we've seen with this team here lately. And it's not just him. I think that there's a, I think the Kyle Schwarber stuff is really swung back in a positive way. Certainly what we've seen with Trey Turner, like there's just a lot of positive momentum, a lot of positive storylines with this team right now. And I mentioned, I mentioned this in the Castellanos story that I wrote and it was focused specifically on Castellanos, but I, I think you could probably attribute it to anybody who's been brought in here since Dave Dombrowski got here. And I, I think that while yes, you're going out and then trying to acquire talent and talent is ultimately what wins. There is an intangible that's a, that you can't measure in baseball that is probably bigger in baseball than any other sport. And, and, and that's that clubhouse culture and I think when Dombrowski puts his teams together, that that is a very important aspect of who he brings in and who he doesn't bring in um, to be part of the team. I, I, I just get a sense of it just from watching how he walks through. I mean, you've seen it. He comes through that clubhouse after a game, congratulating players, going up to talking to guys. Like he's very engaged. He's like the mayor. Yeah, he is. You know, and you know, just thought, like I get like the, the Lorenzo no hitter game. For, I mean, it was a no hitter, yes. So it's very special, but in in reality, it's a it's an early August game against the Washington Nationals, right? It's it's a dog days of baseball game, and it felt magical in the clubhouse, not necessarily just with Lorenzen, because it was great for Lorenzen, right? I mean, we were all everybody was focused on Lorenzen, but if you take in what's going on around the clubhouse on that night and how they're you know, yelling out at Dombrowski, great trade, and and Castellanos is standing there with his arm around him, drinking a beer, and and they're all celebrating, and it's all smiles. And this is during Lorenzen's presser, right? Yeah. This is all that's happening. Like you can sense something a little bit different, and I think that that's this is where he deserves credit. And I don't want to just be him. I think Sam Fold is part of it as well, and their entire team. You know, just you know, scouts and the like, but that they are really looking for people that will fit this culture as much as they have talent to play the sport of baseball. And I think that's a really, really important thing. And it's why I suggest that if this team ever wins a championship, it would be the most beloved because I think that we as Philadelphians relate to that maybe a little bit more than, than most fan bases do. I could go for that. Um, I want to talk about the, the bullpen here. Yeah. Um, and I, let's start with a positive note. Uh, I was extremely impressed. And again, we did not speak to one another following this. Um, I know you had a chance to talk to Jose Alvarado last night, and I'll let you get into that in a second. 
I was in, I was impressed last night, and I thought that his his ninth inning may have been the most important thing to come of last night's game, um, and and for a couple different reasons. Certainly, he gets a save, he throws a clean inning. That's that's great, but I just love the way that it it sort of unfolded. Uh, he he gives up the one out double. Um, he gets is it Ronnie Mauricio? Is that who he he had uh, the, the second out, and then it sets up. Alvarado versus Alonzo, 45 home runs from the right side. One swing of the bat, you probably lose the game. You could say, let's just put his ass on first base and we'll deal with Lindor. Probably not going to beat us with a, with a three run homer. And they say, no, let's go get him. Like, let's go after him. And he comes out 99, 99, 99, and then finishes him with a wicked cutter. And, not only did he execute the pitches, but the aggressiveness, the the attack. Like, we're going to go get this guy. Like, fuck it. We're not letting it go beyond him. Let's go get this son of a bitch. Like, yeah. that's essentially – that was what, what he said. Watching it in real time. Yeah. That was what I was like, wow, they're saying, like, let's go get this fucking guy. And, and I was like, all right, like, boy's pumped up. Let's see what he does. And he executed it. And I, I think – and, and listen, this could sound stupid. Maybe he goes out and has three blow ups, blow ups uh, from here on out. And this is all just a little blip on the radar. But I looked at it and said, that's the type of performance that can turn around a guy's season. Like, not that he's been a disaster, not that he's, he's been like a mess or anything, but he hasn't been Jose Alvarado the way that we came to know him at the end of last year and at the beginning of this season. He's been he's been trying to find it post injury all mm-hmm. year. Last night it looked like that guy, and I wonder if that translates moving forward. I I think it does, um, just from talking to him. And uh, as it turns out, I mean, um, I don't know if anybody saw uh, Reed's the Athletic, saw Matt Gell. He had a, a, a very similar story. Um, I guess he talked to Alvarado when when we were talking to uh, uh, Ranger. Um, I guess he went over to talk to Alvarado. So I went over to Alvarado separately. I, I talked to him. I was the last one actually in the clubhouse last night um, because I was talking to Alvarado for so long. And I turned around and I was the only one in there. Um, but uh, Matt kind of wrote a very similar thing to what I wrote as well today. It, it, it really just, it was Alvarado's call to pitch to Alonzo. And, 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 and Thompson didn't tell us that in, in the, his availability. We asked about, what he said when he went out there and he, and he said, well, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, what their, they knew what their plan was, you know, that Alvarado knew not to be, not to be afraid about walking Alonzo. And I thought when he said that, that he meant you can pitch around him a little bit, you know, and don't worry about it. You have the open base. And then if it doesn't work, okay, fine. Then you got Lindor, but turns out that he gave Alvarado the call. And this is what's interesting to me, Bob, because they went to Kimbrell in the eighth, against Lindor and the rationale was you want a right-hander against Lindor. Lindor's a switch hitter. He's better from the right side. So you want a right-hander to face Lindor. So that's why they went to Kimbrel in the eighth and not Alvarado in the eighth. So, all right, you didn't want Alvarado to face Lindor in the eighth inning. Then why are you giving him the option in the ninth inning between Alonzo mm-hmm. and Lindor? And so it, in this moment, and I, and I looked up the numbers, and to be honest with you, their numbers are pretty similar against left-handed pitchers. The one thing is Alonzo gets on base a little bit better, so he draws more walks. So you think, okay, maybe if you're throwing him a bunch of pitches, then all of a sudden you're maybe you're tired for a lot, uh, for uh, Lindor. Maybe that's not what you want to do. But you, it was almost as if he went against the game plan there, Thompson. And he said to Alvarado, who do you want? And Alvarado's one, I want this guy. And then he went out and got him like that to me is that's where you're like, okay, throw the, throw the, the computer printouts away. We're going to go on feel and I'm going to trust my guy to do what he thinks he should do in this spot. And he did it. And I, I think that that says a lot for the way Rob managed that game last night. And also the, the confidence that he has in Alvarado right now. We talked about it uh, maybe last week. Said, I, I feel like when I, I've been watching Jose Alvarado pitch lately, it, it's like he's trying to have an entire season every time he picks up the ball. He's not competing in the moment. He's not competing against the hitter that he's facing. He's competing against what he was last year, what he mm-hmm. was at the start of this year. 
And it just felt like to me last night, he was locked into a different degree. And again, it wasn't, uh, you know, an immaculate inning. He did give up a double. He he did face a tight spot, but th- that is going to happen in the playoffs. And as much as I'd like to see it just be strike one, strike two, you're out. Yeah. I, I kind of like the fact that he got into a little bit of a bind and responded to it. And I think that, you know, in addition to looking dialed in and looking focused in the moment, I just think sometimes you need those results in tight spots in order to sort of get over the hump. And when you look at him specifically, it's not a stuff thing. It's, it's not, it, it's not about velocity. It, I really do think it's about feel and comfort on the mound and confidence. Mm-hmm. I think that that's the, been the missing part for him. And uh, you know, it's back-to-back uh, appearances now where he's, he's thrown a clean inning in an important spot. And uh, I just think that last night's situation could potentially propel him uh, to, to a different level. Now, that's a positive. I, I do have some concerns here. I don't think you can talk about the Phillies bullpen objectively at the moment and, and not have concerns. Uh, and I want to tap into something that you and I had talked about uh, via text the other night, which at the time I sort of like rolled my eyes at, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you your flowers in a moment. But before I do that, I want to, I want to get to Craig Kimbrell. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think that one of the things that can be said about the Nick Castellanos play uh, on Wednesday afternoon is that, that Nick bailed him out. He, he bailed did. out Craig Kimbrell. And, you know, last night, uh, Craig got himself into a tough spot and he was able to pitch his way out of it um, with, a, with a big strikeout. That being said, two straight appearances where it has been very uh, anxious. It's been a very anxious inning. And he's just letting base runners, basically, as I wrote today in the newsletter, do somersaults in into second and third base once they reach. I, I don't know about you, but there is part of me that's like, you, you can't just, you have to make your pitches. And I know this is what he, he has said, and this is what he would say to this criticism. Like, I'd rather worry about making my pitches and executing my pitches than, than getting outside myself and worrying about the pitch timer and being overly concerned about holding guys on. But, like, you can't turn a walk into a triple either, like, every single time. And, and clearly, this has gotten scouted up to the point where opponents are just saying, like, go ahead, like, throw me out. You're not going to. You're not going to hold me on. You're not going to do a good enough job to give Real Muto a shot. I have some concerns about what I'm seeing here. And it's crazy because if you read me the stat line for September, he's made eight appearances. He, in eight innings pitch, he's only allowed six hits. He struck out 11. Uh, he hasn't given up an earned run yet this month. And so you're like, well, what the hell are we talking about? Right. Opponents have a 550 OPS against them, but he's also walked six batters in eight innings. He's gotten himself into a lot of tight spots and like, it kind of just feels like he's playing with fire. I'm kind of curious to know what you think about what's going on with him right now. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it back to you for just a second before I give a give an answer. And then this is how I'm going to throw it back to you. You just said, when we were talking about Alvarado, um, that you don't mind the fact that he gets him gets himself into a spot and gets out of it, right? It's, it's a good thing, kind of right. like yeah, all right, yeah. It's good to see you, you can you're not going to let it snowball. Well, the one thing about Craig Kimbrell is he's gotten himself into a lot of spots <laughs> lately, and with the exception of that LA loss um, where they where they blew the game against the uh, against the Angels back at the end of August almost every time that he's given up base runners, he's gotten out of it. He's got two base runners against the Cardinals got out of it. in that three, nothing win, um, he gave up a base runner against Milwaukee and they had brought the tying run to the plate. He got out of it. He gave up two base runners against the Padres in that crazy game that they had the huge lead and almost blew and got out of it. Um, you know, gave up a, 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 a run, brought the tying run to the plate against the Braves in a game that they won. And that was in, uh, that was the first game of the series. Uh, against uh, of the first game of the doubleheader uh, back on 9-11, and, they got, and he got out of it. Um, actually had a decent performance, even though he took the loss. I mean, he gives up a hit, right, but that's the extra inning game. It's not really on him. But then walks the bases loaded against the Cardinals in St. Louis and gets out of it. it has uh, the, the walks a runner and has, you know, the go-ahead run getting to the plate against the Braves, gets out of it. Two hits last, you know, last night, or uh, yeah, against the against the Mets, 
and gets yeah, out yeah. of it. Yeah. No, listen, I mean, I, I hear the point and it, I guess it sounds somewhat like hypocritical for me to commend the guy and then in the same breath, you know, kind of be critical of, of the, the next guy for, for basically the same thing. I guess the, the difference for me is, is somewhat of somewhat of the optics. Like I look at the, the game on, on Wednesday and say, you're lucky. You know, yeah, like he was lucky. You, sure. you didn't stuff your way out of that. You you got bailed out. That that's what happened. And you you put yourself in that situation not because, uh, in part, because you didn't execute pitches, but you you put yourself in that position and in these tight spots. And it was self inflicted. It, it wasn't. I made a pitch and this guy got on base. It was like you look at you look at the at bat to start the uh, the inning against the Braves on Wednesday. He immediately falls behind 2-0, and then he gets hit with a pitch violation. Like, mm -hmm. come on, man. Like, I know that you you don't want to rush and you don't want to give up a home run or, you know, not make your pitch. I, I get that. Like, in that spot, that's the winning run, and now you're running a 3-0 count. And then he's on – and then Luke Williams comes into the game, and he's on first base, and then he's on third base because you don't even bother. Like, you don't even – you could care less. I mean, that's the winning run now 90 feet away because you either do not care or because you are incapable of of giving him a competitive look and giving your catcher a chance. Like, that does concern me. Like, this is a results-oriented business, and he has not allowed a run this month. And as you've pointed out, he has gotten out a lot of, of these situations. But – I, I do not want to see next month in a one run game in the eighth or ninth inning, a leadoff walk turn into a guy on third base with less than two outs. Like some of this is controllable. I'd like to see him try to control it. Yes. Um, and I was playing devil's advocate with you there for just a minute, just to have a little fun, but Thank I, you. I too, <laughs> I too agree with you that you can only go to that. Well, so many times. Um, it, it's, it's, you should be, feel good about the fact that here is a veteran probable hall of fame reliever. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who knows, you know, doesn't let the moment get too big for him, knows how to get out of situations that he's created for himself like those. Right. So, so you should have confidence to sit there and say like, okay, this is not going to blow up on him. He'll find a way through it. But at the same time, you have to know that you can't keep doing that every time out and expect to get out of it every time out. Because at some point, somebody's going to get you. And especially if it's in the playoffs, you're likely going up against a, a team that's got the ability to get you more likely than not. Um, so, yes, you don't want to have that happen on a regular basis. And that's why I do – see a little bit of concern but at the same time I, I i'm not overly concerned because he has proven that hey i can get through this it might be a tightrope walk but i i'm a master tightrope walker and I'll, I'll get out of it right so so there's so it's it's like that fine line but you know where i say okay i this guy if anybody can get out of it it's going to be kimbrel but at the same time man why are you putting yourself in this situation <laughs> right yeah. I, that's how I look at it I know that we've spent a lot of time. It's it's sort of been my focus. Like, what does this mean for next month? Like everything that we talk about, I always say, so what, is, what does that mean moving forward? How do you project that out in, in October? I'm not even telling you that I, I have concern about him. It's it's not like should should Craig Kimbrell close games or, or be the, the, the primary finisher in the eighth inning if that's the way that the lineup unfolds. I'm, he right. is that guy. There is no action to be taken here. Um it's more of just a commentary on the anxiety level that he's tapping into as he's taking the ball. I mean, there has been no comfort at all watching him pitch. Like there's a, like there, there is that sense of he's, he gets out of these spots. He's a veteran. He still has good stuff. He can do it, but like, yo brother, like let's mix in a one, two, three every now and then that would, that would be cool too. And uh, I think that that's probably my, my point. Um, I want to know how excited you are. And there's, the thing I want to get to with the bullpen too, but I just want to break this up real quick. How excited are you tonight to watch Tylon Walker take the baseball without uh, the services of Kimbrell or Alvarado and likely Hoffman? Uh, because I don't foresee those three guys pitching three straight days. How about you? Um, you might be able to get Hoffman. Feels like a Mets underdog spot tonight. Just, yeah, just saying. Well, you might, you might be able to have Hoffman pitch tonight. Um, 
only because he only faced the one batter, and I think it was three pitches yesterday. And, yeah, I know he warmed up. Um, but that what's the difference between throwing three pitches in the game and throwing three extra warm-up pitches, right? I mean, so, like, that's – Do the Phillies need to score eight runs tonight to win the baseball game? They need to score. I do think that. I do think that the Mets will put up, you know, four or five for sure. So I do think the Phillies are going to have to score off the Mets. Um, yeah, this is this is one – of all the, of the four games in this series, the one that I – was least confident in for the Phillies was tonight's game. I can't, I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> well, even more so after what you just – like after you're pointing it out. Like, I mean, yeah. the bullpen is going to be short tonight. I mean, you're going to probably get – Dominguez is probably going to throw tonight. and I guess Strom will probably get a an inning or two tonight. Like I said, you might have Hoffman. Um but you really don't have much else. Like, yeah, I mean, listen, going? maybe maybe Taiwan Walker dials it up against his former team tonight. You know, it's it's been a while since he's gone out and really had a, a start that you've said, okay, I feel I feel good about that. So maybe maybe he's due. Yeah, maybe. And you know, who knows? Maybe Lorenzen gets another shot tonight. Yeah, to he might kind of, to kind of fix himself um, since he's been so terrible since he's uh, since the no hitter. Um, so I actually want to hit on a couple things here. I know we said we can only do 40 minutes. Yeah. And I'm running out of time. So let me like rapid fire you because three things that I wanted to talk about have all just sort of come up right here. I sent you a text message yesterday. Yeah. Zach Eflin's having a nice year, huh? Yeah. And and then this is where, I mean, look, I, I think that this is a just notice it, but understand it at the same time. In other I words, understand it. I totally understand well, it. Yeah, but I, and I know you do, but I think it's worth mentioning since we're bringing it up on the podcast, just for the people listening. The, the idea was, well, you, you know, we didn't, the Phillies didn't bring back um, Eflin and they went out and signed Walker. Um, and the rationale obviously is, well, we couldn't trust signing Eflin for, you know, multiple years because of his history of injuries, which is why we didn't bring him back. I get that. And you get that. And I think most people get that. Um, and that, the, but that necess- that doesn't necessarily mean that the signing of Taiwan Walker to a four year, $72 million contract was a good idea. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough. Like Eflin's objectively had a better season than Taiwan Walker. He's thrown more innings as well. So right. for the, the health concerns, he, he's, he's, Logged more innings, um, you know, in Taiwan Walker's uh, defense, he's he's taking the ball pretty much every time out. I know that they've given him a little extra rest occasionally to try to get him straightened out as he's kind of gone through his his ups and downs. Uh, but, man, like when you look at that evaluation, you say, like, you'd probably like to have that one back. Like, we still don't know what next year looks like, and we don't know what 25 looks like for Eflin either. And, you know, maybe those injury concerns come to fruition and, and you say, I say, look, um, and, and maybe Taiwan Walker makes 30 starts each in the next two years too. But when you look at those deals side by side and you say, my goodness, like an extra year and an extra $32 million and, and what has happened this season, that's a, that's a tough one, especially when you consider how, how favorably he was viewed in the locker room and, and how good of a guy he was too. And, and not that Taiwan Walker isn't, but like you had Zach Eflin, he was in your clubhouse. Those guys loved him. Uh, that's one, like, I kind of wish maybe they had that one back. Uh, just, just wondering. Yeah, I mean, I mean, with hindsight being twenty twenty, of sure. course, yeah. you'd, you'd want. But I, to... I do. I mean, listen, I get it. I, I certainly yeah. understand the rationale. And at the time, I echoed it. I was like, I, I don't know that you can trust Zach Eflin to hold up for a three year deal. Like, do you want to allocate, uh, you know, seventeen million dollars a year or whatever it shakes out to for Zach Eflin if you don't think he's going to make more than sixteen starts a year for you? I mean. I, I understand it, but yes, this is one where hindsight's twenty twenty. I'm watching him rack up eight strikeouts through four innings yesterday against the Angels, and I'm like, man, like this yeah, would be nice. This it, would be it, nice to have right now. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I and, and look, I think that the the difference probably is if you don't go and get Walker and you go and get another, you know, starting pitcher who was a free agent last year who's had a better year than Taiwan Walker, then you probably don't question it as much right i think that i think that walker's failings have made it seem made you long for zach f a little bit more i I still don't know if like i'm being unfair like you've you've heard me like kind of like snort and giggle like when when taiwan walker walker comes out uh comes up in conversation when we when we bring him up on the show it's like the numbers aren't that bad like his numbers are okay he's 
He's won a lot of games, which obviously we know isn't all about pitcher performance, but like, it's not like he has a five and a half ERA. Like he's, he's had his, his moments. He's had his stretches, but every time I see the name come up on like the probable pitchers right now, I just go, Oh, it's just been, it has not been aesthetically pleasing to watch. I, I no. guess that that is one thing I, I will say. And it hasn't been for a while now. Uh, it, it's, I guess July is the last time that he was really in a nice little, little groove where you felt like, all right, like, you know, you feel pretty good about him being out there right now. For we'll sure. see that. I mean, you know, we talked about it earlier this week on Sunday, he gets seven innings. They did it out of necessity. They wanted to save the bullpen. Just maybe he happens to run into that night where he, where he goes six, six plus and, and holds the team in check. We'll, we'll see. The, the last one I wanted to get to on the, on the bullpen, and then I'm going to hit you with just a, a quick, a quick hitter. Um, you sent me a message on, on Wednesday. Uh, the Phillies had gone to Gregory Soto late yeah. in the game. And I guess that was to uh, replace Hoffman, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I want to say perfect. it was like a first and third type situation. Yep. And they go to Soto and you texted me that you would have gone to match Strom. And I said, all right, like, and my, my response at the time was just, if, if this is what we're talking about, then, then you don't have great options. Like, Strom versus Soto, the way that that they've gone here, uh, okay, I I, I guess. But, like, as things have played out, I think, you know, Matt Strom went through that transition from the rotation to the bullpen. He was giving up a lot of home runs. They were trying to do the the double innings, bringing him for that that second up-down. That's where he was getting burned. And I started to, like, sort of sour a little bit on, on what Matt Strom could be. You look up though now, and you look at like the last month or so, and he's given them some really important innings, and he's gotten some very key outs for them. Is he ahead of Gregory Soto now? Like the, that was your your gut feel in that moment. But how about like big picture? I mean, I think he is, but I was surprised. But it surprised me. Like I felt that way before the Atlanta game, and it surprised me that they went to Soto in that spot because I had felt that they had already gone towards Strom for those kinds of spots. The only thing, and I, you know, I'm not in Atlanta, so I don't get a chance to ask Topper after the game, but maybe they did not want to really throw Strom in that game. Maybe they were trying to, you know, manage, manage usage again there. Um, and that's why they go to Soto. And then ultimately Strom has to come in because they go extra innings. And, you know, well, who are you going to go to? It's, oh, well, that's the next guy up, I guess. We didn't really want to use him today, but here we go. Um, that's the only justification I can come up with. But I, I do think that my sense is, is that if you're growing, you know, we're going to see here in these last nine games and then maybe even into the beginning of the, of the playoff run, if there is a earlier – lefty matchup needed before you get to Alvarado that Strom is the guy that they go to and not Soto Matt Strom's last 15 appearances 172 ERA with a 1.02 whip he's struck out 21 and 15 and two thirds he's been really good and (laughs) and he's been good for a while now and you know I, I gotta I gotta say like it there was a time where I'm just like you cannot seriously be going to this guy for for key outs late in games and i was wrong i mean he's he has produced and he's done it consistently and you know in the same breath like i was very disappointed with what gregory soto gave them on wednesday that was a a situation where he was fortunate that the damage was not more significant than what it was but in fairness to him like you look at his numbers you say okay his last seven appearances He's, he's got a 0.88 whip. He's he's given up three earned runs, though, in five and two-thirds innings. And it's sort of like the story of his season where, like, he's pretty nasty. He gets a lot of strikeouts. He has some really good games. But, man, like, when he's off, he's a killer. And th- that's kind of what, what happened on Wednesday. They were lucky to survive it. But when you just start to look at the consistency of the thing, I think the way I would approach this if I'm the Phillies is this is not set in stone. Like, we're not writing this in ink. It's do I need a strikeout? Not that Strom strikeout numbers aren't good, but if you're like, I need stuff, like I need, I need to gamble here. I need the strikeout. I'm probably going Soto, but if I, if I need a clean inning, I might be leaning Strom, 
You know, I, I think that that's probably the way I'm going at this point. Yeah, and I'm not surprised. I won't be surprised if they go Strom, even if you need the strikeout. I really, I'm, I really wouldn't be, um, especially if there's guys on base and it's a tight spot. Because tight spot, yeah. The one thing about Strom that is different than Soto is, well, two things. One, I don't think he walks as many, and I'm not looking at any numbers here, but I don't think that he's as likely to walk a batter. Like I, I think he's more in the strike zone than than Soto is. But secondly, he's deceptive, right? I mean, that's what that's how he's successful. Yeah. He's not overpowering you. He's throwing 94, right? Soto's throwing 97, 98. Um, so it's not overpowering you. It's just that it, it, because he's so like gangly when in his delivery, and it's not that's not making fun of him. It's just saying that that's how his delivery is. It's um, it, you don't see that ball till later, and so it gets on you quicker. It seems faster than it is. So. Um, and you can look at his strikeout rate all year. I mean, even when he was a starter, he was striking out guys at a higher rate than he ever had in his career. And I remember we were talking about it on the episodes back then. So I think it's the same thing, right? I mean, I think that that's Strom well, might be the guy. I, I, you, you, you're time. correct. I mean, he is walking fewer batters here uh, over the last each of their last 30 appearances. I mean, Strom's only walked eight in his last 35 innings. Let me just give you this on Gregory Soto real quick. Kind of speaks to the point that like when he's not on, he is not on. He gives up base runners, they're scoring. So in his last 26 and a third innings, that's a span of 30 games. He's walked seven. He's given up 23 hits. So that's 30 base runners. Do you know how many of those runners have, have been charged against him in terms of earned runs allowed? 30 15. was his number, so I'm, I'm going to guess. 15 of his 30. I mean, so you, you talk about like uh, base runner prevention. It's not yeah. that big, right? But when those base runners get on, they're scoring almost every time. I mean, half the time. That's crazy. Yeah. That is crazy. Uh, all right. Listen, I, I know that we're, we're sort of uh, running out of time here. I, I did want to bring up – I do have a quick question before one more thing. Uh, yeah. You don't even have to expand uh, on your answer. You could just answer it. Better trade deadline acquisition, Noah Syndergaard or Michael Lorenzen? To be determined. Okay. I mean, really, I mean, you know, right now. When I ask you this question again in three weeks, what's the answer going to be? Well, I'm, I'm hoping to say it's Michael Lorenzen. Yeah. Well, right um, now it's not. You know, Right that. now it's not. But, I mean, I think, you know, we'll see how Lorenzen comes out of the bullpen. Remember, Syndergaard wasn't really used in the playoffs much at all. A little mm -hmm. bit, but, you know, not okay. a lot. Um, I think Lorenzen would be. Well, got I think, to the World Series. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I think Lorenzen will be used a little bit more than than – um, Syndergaard was okay. All right, hit me with one last thing. It's actually a combo. One last thing, but you know we 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 stress so much about pitching and and oh the Phillies pitching, Phillies pitching. Two big stories out today about the Dodgers pitching, which they don't know what the hell they're going to do in the playoffs. They have no. Let me up here to fail. I haven't even had time to go to the bathroom today, let alone look at yeah. the league notes. Well, so. The, so the Dodgers, the Dodgers have basically announced that their playoff plan for pitching is going to be, you know, just basically starters go three, four innings, maybe have a, a bulk guy, maybe, and then just, you know, get, try to get to the guys at the back of the bullpen. Even a guy like Kershaw is only, he only threw four innings the other day. Like they are not, they have no length whatsoever. Dude, so, maybe the Phillies, maybe the Phillies ought to just be the sixth seed and and <laughs> take take their shot that way. I mean, well, here's the other news: Max Freed mm. back on the IL. Oh boy! Now it's a blister situation, uh, but it's the 15 day IL. If you go 15 days, he's not eligible to come off before the playoffs. So mm. the first time he's back is for a playoff game, and it could be against the Phillies. Yeah. After having not pitched for two oh, two weeks. Does that, yeah. does, that, does that excite you at all? Does that make you feel a little bit better about that potential matchup in the in the second round? Yeah, the way that that is uh, being explained here as I'm reading in real time, they're just letting him skip the last two starts so he can be fully healthy for the postseason, which he may be. But, again, it's just like about that – what he's going to go through is what that entire team's going to go through. You're shutting it down. Yeah. And you have to just start back up. Like you're basically, you're making an opening day start again, you know, and we'll, we'll see. That is the, the one variable. That is the one variable, man, where you just say, Hmm. And you know, as much as I like, um, 
uh, Bobby Miller uh, with the Dodgers. Like I watched yeah. him the other night. You're a sicko because you sent me that text message and you're like, I watched the Marlins. What was it? Marlins Mets. I watched Mets uh, Marlins, Pirates Cubs, and then <laughs> Tigers Dodgers. I mean, that is, that is, you need help, but you know, I, I was watching the Dodgers game as well. Uh, my, my wife had gone to bed and I was like trying to unwind. And so I just, I had MLB network on, I guess the game was on MLB network and I was, I was watching it and I like him a lot. And he was really impressive against the Phillies earlier this year. I'm not yeah. as impressed with him right now. I don't know if he's hitting a wall or what the deal is there. I think he is, yeah. That Dodgers team looks like they could get, they could get picked off in the first round. And, 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 and you know, why I don't, you know, why I don't, I'm not a huge Milwaukee guy. Right, yeah. I'm not a big fan of Milwaukee, but as bad as the Dodgers' pitching situation is right now, if Burns and Woodruff and Peralta can just go out there and and keep the Dodgers' bats kind of sort of at bay, Brewers can win that series. Yeah, well, I, I got one for you. real quick, and, and I, we can do this in one minute. I really did want to ask you this. Uh, yeah. I wrote today about the uh, current playoff odds. I don't mean probabilities, but I mean like the odds makers and how they see everything shaking out. The Phillies currently have the six best odds to win the World Series. They're mm -hmm. behind the Braves, the Dodgers, the Astros, Orioles, and Rays. I would tell you that I actually think that they have a better chance to win the World Series than the Baltimore Orioles and the Tampa Bay Rays. And I think I, I would make a I think I can make a pretty convincing argument about the Dodgers too. Yeah. Win the World Series. I'm not yeah. saying that the Phillies are better than these teams, but when you factor in intangibles and feel and yeah. experience and big time showcase players and the whole deal, I just feel like I would pick the Phillies before I would pick at least three of those teams. I would I would rank them right now Braves one, Astros That's two, true. Phillies three. Yeah, so would I. So would I. That's, That's exactly how I would rank I would the do. World Series probabilities this year, and yeah, and the only and reason, there. yeah, and the only reason I think that the Phillies are sixth, Bob, is because they have a tougher road to go through mm -hmm. in in the yeah. National League. You're going to have to beat two of those teams, like you have to beat the you're going to have to beat yeah, the Braves. Because when you look at it, like the Orioles are the team that you have to go get, right? Like the right. Orioles are going to be the high seed. So you got to go get them. The Phillies have to go through the high seeds. Like yeah. I understand why the odds are what they are. I don't yeah. think that they're necessarily wrong, but start talking about like value plays and things like that. Phillies are a great value. Play. What are they? What are they right now to get to the World Series? Uh, I don't know. Hold on. I think I actually do have it in front of me here. I am looking at it. Phillies have uh, the third best odds to win the National League pennant plus six fifty. The Braves are plus one fifty. The Dodgers plus two hundred. Plus six fifty is good odds, man. Yeah. I mean, I I mean I'd rather a, take the value Braves. play. I would take the Braves because I think that's what's going to pay. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. Uh, but I would rather have the Phillies at plus six fifty than the Dodgers at plus two hundred any day of the week. And and again, like listen, LA might be able to, uh, you know, Freeman and bets their way through it. Uh, but I, I don't. I just don't think they are. No, nor nor do I. And look, if you have a little bit of, of play money and you want to take a shot at something that's a little bit of a longer shot, I would go Phillies plus six fifty. So what are they to win the World Series then? I don't have it in front of me. I want to say it's plus fourteen hundred though. That's again good odds. Yeah. I mean, look. I mean, it, do I sit here and, and tell you I think that the Phillies can go Braves, Dodgers, Astros, win, win, win in those series? That's going to be a tough thing to do, yeah. right? But. It, that's probably the 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 path that's going to have to happen. If, you know, with the Dodgers being the one iffy one, if if you're if you get past the Braves, it might be a walk. <laughs> Bold take here: Phillies Astros rematch in the World Series. Houston becomes a more hated city than Dallas in the city of Philadelphia. If not, mattress Ron Mac, yeah. mattress yeah. Mac, yeah. we can f bomb him yeah, left, can, right, and center again. I can't do another another. I don't think I can even have the Phillies in the World Series if mattress Mac's going to be there. I can't do any more mattress Mac content, man. Just I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you for uh, checking out Crossed Up. Uh, if you're a first time listener, thanks for dropping in. If you're a loyal listener, thank you, as always, for coming back and checking us out. You can uh, find the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you get your shows. You can read Anthony at Crossing Broad. You can also follow Matt and Sam Philly. You can check out my newsletter, redoctoberphilly.com. Follow that. It comes Monday through Friday every day. You can also check me out occasionally on crossingbroad.com as well. Follow me at Bob underscore Wankel, and we will talk to you on Monday morning. Thanks, everyone.